This evening our text is in uh, Matthew chapter 13, which if you're familiar with that uh, chapter, it it is the chapter on the kingdom parables where our Lord uh, tells us the character of his kingdom, actually tells us a good deal about it, how one comes into it, how it grows, how big it's going to get, how powerful it's going to be, but also how much we should desire it, how much we must desire it if we're actually going to enter into it. Again, the Lord gives us the same truths in in a variety of ways. For instance, when he says, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been proclaimed and violent men take it by force. He is talking there about the same thing we're looking at this evening. The kind of desire that needs to be in our hearts if we are to pursue the kingdom of heaven and actually enter into it, we have to desire it strongly enough to do a kind of violence what uh, Thomas Watson called a a holy violence to ourselves. We need to kill our sins, and we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, that's what this study is all about. Let's, um, Let's begin by looking at our text, which are really two parables in Matthew 13, the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price in verses 44 through 46. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, so far we've seen in this particular study that when Jesus died on the cross, we died with him by faith. And when he was raised again to life, we were raised to newness of life. The Bible says if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you have died with him to sin, to your old way of living, to your old desires and those things that had to do with the world. And you have been raised with him again to life, now to live, for the glory of God. Basically, the principle of death and life is at work in you if you've trusted the Lord because the Spirit of God is at work in you, giving you the desire to kill your sins and to put on righteousness, moving you to turn away from the old life and towards the new life that Jesus has for you. Now, again, we saw that this is easy to say, but it's a very difficult thing to do. This process isn't an easy one because when you take this path, the world will turn against you if you go this direction just as it turned turned against the Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit and your flesh will be in constant warfare. Uh, Putting off your sins, as you've already seen, will be like cutting off your hands or your feet or plucking out your eyes because sin doesn't go easily. It's something that we desire, and that's why it's difficult to give it up. But with the spirit in your soul, we also saw that you can do this. You can walk on this path and realize as well that this is the only path that leads to heaven. It is the road that the Lord calls you to walk on. So you need to get off the path that leads to destruction, the path that the world walks on, and you need to walk on the path that the Lord has laid out for you. Now, we also saw that since this way of life requires as much from us as it actually does, since it requires you to lay down your life and to pick up your cross, if you're going to walk on this path, you need a proper motivation. And last week we began to look at the kind of motivation that you need in order to do this. The first thing we saw that you need is the motivation that faith provides. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 11.1 that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the only way that we can see what it is that we need to see. And if you have faith this evening, You can actually see these things. You have that ability, uh, that which those without faith can't see. You can see the promised inheritance 
you can see what it is that the Lord has promised. You can see the glory and beauty of God and the desirability of going the way that he has called you to go. That really is one of the reasons why you actually trusted in the Lord and why you were willing to pay what you must pay to follow him. It's the same reason why those who have followed the Lord and made such sacrifices for him were willing to pay or willing to do what they did. It was the reason why we saw that Noah was willing to spend a hundred years of his life building a boat because he saw what God said was true through faith. He knew the flood was coming. And if he was to be saved and his family was to be saved, he had to build that boat. It's the reason why Abraham left his family and his relatives to go to the land of promise, a land which he hadn't seen, and knew that even though he wandered there as a stranger, that God had given him that land and had given it also to his descendants. It's the reason why Moses was willing to give up the power and prestige of Egypt in order to suffer with the people of God because he believed the promises that God had made and he knew that there was really no other choice. It's why the disciples were willing to give up all that they did to follow Jesus and why they and the early martyrs were willing even to die even to give up their lives, that which is most precious to them, in order to follow the Lord Jesus. What they saw made it all worthwhile, the fulfillment of the promises. And again, if you have faith, you can see the same thing. Now, you may not see it as clearly as they do because your faith may not be as strong as their faith, but you must have seen what it is they've seen to some degree, otherwise you would never have begun to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But now something more is implied in what they saw that made them actually want to go the direction that they went. Last week I kind of mentioned it, but didn't really develop it because I was wanting to develop it more this week, that they not only saw these things and knew that they were real, that they had this conviction that it was real, but they also desired these things. They wanted them. They saw the fulfillment of the promises. They wanted what it is they saw, and they wanted it more than what they had in this world. Now, Jesus, this evening, gives us two parables that bring out this truth, that of a man who found a treasure in the field, and that of a merchant who found a pearl of great price. Now, Jesus tells us that both of them came by this treasure or their particular treasures in different ways. One just seemed to stumble on it one day. He found this treasure in the field. We're not even told he was looking for it, but he found it, while the other was searching carefully for precious pearls and found one of such great value. Now, this might, as uh, some have said, have something to do with how people enter the kingdom of heaven, how the Lord saves some who aren't even really looking come across someone someday who shares the gospel with them. They weren't really looking for the Lord, but suddenly see their need and they see the value of the kingdom and they're willing to give up what they must for it while he saves others who actually are searching for the kingdom of heaven, those who have heard about it and those who have not yet found the grace that they have needed to enter. But the one thing that both of them had in common that we don't want to miss is what they found in these treasures that they were worth more than everything else that they had, more than anything else they could possibly imagine, so that they were willing to give up everything that they had in order to have this treasure. Now, Jesus tells you this evening that the treasure that he offers to you in the gospel is going to, well, cost you going to cost you everything that you have. If you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you have to be willing to part with everything that you have, every relationship, everything that you own, even your own life. You must be willing to give up every sin and follow the Lord wherever he leads you. But the only way that you can actually pay this price is if you love the Lord enough, if this is valuable enough to you, if it is to you a treasure beyond all comparison, if the Lord is that precious to you, you will gladly give up all that you have 
in order that you might have him. Now this evening I want us to consider that in order to die to your sins and to put on righteousness, you must not only see the kingdom of heaven by faith, but you must also desire it and you must love its king most of all, more than anything else, more than all your possessions, even more than your own life. So basically, we want to look at two things this evening. First of all, that you must treasure the Lord and the kingdom of heaven, really, more than anything else, if you are to enter into it, if you are to put off your sins and to put on Christ. And secondly, we want to consider a little bit about how you can do this. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing, actually, to do it. But we do need to remember that the Lord in his grace and mercy not only tells us what must be, what we must do, but he also tells us how we can do it, what provisions he has made to enable us to do this, uh, because he is, of course, a God of infinite grace. So first of all, you must love the Lord more than anything else. Again, let me draw your attention to the fact that those in these parables were willing to give everything they have in order to have this treasure. And our Lord tells us plainly that that is the cost of obtaining the kingdom of heaven. This isn't something that Jesus kept as a secret from his disciples, but something that he uh, actually explained quite openly. And it's something we do need to come to grips with. I think it's no more and more explicitly mentioned than it is in Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Let me read that for you. Now large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. You know, there have been books written about the hard sayings of Jesus, and they oftentimes attempt to explain this in a way that allows us basically to go on living our lives the way that we wanted to live them anyway. And you know that many evangelicals today, many evangelical leaders in many churches, uh, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation about this this morning, uh, would tell you that you should never tell anyone what the cost of entering the kingdom of heaven is because if you told them, they may not want to enter. Instead, why don't you just tell them to pray the prayer, and once they've prayed it, then they're basically in the kingdom, and then you can tell them what the price is, what it is that they've actually agreed to do. But then they would also say, it doesn't matter whether they do it or not, if they've prayed the prayer, if they've trusted in Jesus in that sort of sense, they're going to make it to heaven anyway. But that's not what our Lord tells us. He actually says that if we are to enter the kingdom at all, we have to be willing to pay the price. And so we ought to count the cost before we actually decide that we're going to follow Jesus. Otherwise, we're going to start following him, but we're not going to be able to finish because what the Lord requires is going to be more than we thought and more than we're willing to pay. So what is it that is the cost? What are we supposed to be willing to pay? Well, Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to us as well, that they had to hate their closest relationships in comparison to their love for him. Now, the disciples undoubtedly had parents. Some of them had spouses and children. But the Lord called them to leave them, at least for a time. I mean, not to abandon them, absolutely, because the gospel reminds us that we do have obligations to our aging parents, and we have obligations to our spouses, and we have obligations to our children. 
But there are certainly those times when to serve the Lord means that we're going to have to give up something of that relationship, even as the disciples who were married left their spouses for a time and followed Jesus for three and a half years while they were being discipled. This is what you must be willing to do if the Lord should require it in order to enter the kingdom out of love for him. Now, Paul tells us that to follow Jesus, you must be willing to give up certain things that I, I think that many people in many churches take for granted is an absolute uh, given, something that they're able to do. I mean, you've heard about people who um, say young Christian ladies who get involved with non-Christian guys and they think that if they just date them, if they think if they marry them, that somehow they're going to convert them to Christ. But the Lord says, no, if you are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, you, you must be willing to give up the possibility of marrying such individuals as unbelievers. Paul says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship is light with darkness? There was a young man who came to this church one time who professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was raised in a Christian household. And he said the Lord told him that he was supposed to marry Lady Gaga. And I told him, <laughs> I told him that, well, not only does the Lord not speak to us in such terms today, but he would never tell you to do something which is so clearly against his word. He commands you not to do anything like that. Not that he had any particular chance of doing it, of course. But you shouldn't even desire that. That's the cost that you needed to count before you would even follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You give up wickedness. Now, if you love the Lord, you're certainly going to be willing to give these things up. You know, Paul even goes further in 1 Corinthians 7 and says that there's even the possibility of giving up marriage altogether and family that you might better serve the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. And the reason why he said that is because if you are unmarried and unentangled with a family, you can devote much more of your time and energy to the Lord. And we'd all admit, whether you're a husband or a wife, that having that relationship and having children does require a certain amount of time and energy. Of course, Paul goes on to say, if you don't have the gift to be content in that kind of a situation, you may marry, but only in the Lord. He continues in verse 9, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, the Lord isn't trying to make your life difficult by saying these things, but he simply wants to put things in their proper perspective. The Lord wants to be first in your life, and if you can serve the Lord better by being single and be content and give yourself to the Lord more, then that's what you should do. But if you can't serve the Lord in that way because of the struggles you have, then you must marry and then serve the Lord in a married state. Either way, you do what you do for the glory of God. Now, he goes on to say this, that you must be willing also to give up close relationships with those who are in the world in order that you might remain holy to him. Remember what the Bible says, that bad company corrupts good morals, and if by getting too close to an individual it draws your heart into the things of the world, then you need to give those things up. This is a warning to us against, again, uh, not, not only desiring close relationships with people who are in the world, and I'm not talking here just about marital kinds of relationships, but even close friendships and partnerships. Those things can cause us to be drawn into the world, even admiring the people of the world too much. If our affection for them is too strong, it can take away from our love for the Lord. It's true. You have to be willing to set these things aside to pursue the kingdom of heaven. And of course, if you love the Lord, that's exactly what you'll do. Set aside anything that gets in your way. Now, if this applies to people, it certainly also applies to things. The Lord is not going to take second place. Some of the disciples had businesses. You know that Peter and Andrew and James and John were all fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. 
And Paul, well, Paul was a Pharisee, but that wasn't exactly a business. But when Jesus called them, they left those things behind. They left all their possessions to follow him. And the Lord says, you must be willing to do the same thing. Remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he says, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me and you'll have treasures in heaven. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great possessions and he could not let go of them. He loved those things too much. And so he actually missed heaven. Now, again, the Lord was not saying by this that you need to give up all your possessions and give them to the poor. He said that to the rich young ruler because he knew that those possessions had possession of him. And he knew that they were, in his heart, his God, his idol, and that in which he loved and trusted. So Jesus put his finger on that and said, you have to give that up. You have to love me more. You have to follow me. But he wasn't willing to do it. The Lord says we must be willing to give up all our possessions in order to follow him. If you love him, you will. And that's the only way that you can possibly do it. You must love him more than these things, more than people, more than your spouse, more than your children, more than father or mother, more than possessions. Jesus has to be first. Now, the Lord also won't take second place to fame or glory. You know, most of the people of this world are seeking for that, that very thing. They want recognition. They want to be remembered. They want people to respect them and honor them. Well, Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion, at least those who were following him, how can you believe? How can you have faith, saving faith, when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Those who seek glory in this world, those who seek fame and honor, are not Christians. They can't be Christians. If they were, they would be seeking that honor and glory that comes from God, that honor he bestows, which only comes by way of humiliation. It doesn't come by you know, promoting yourself, but humbling yourself and becoming the servant of all. God will bestow honor on whom he will, but it has to come in that way. Now, if you love him, you'll give up the honor from the world, and certainly the world will never honor anyone who takes the path that Jesus calls you to take. But the Lord will honor you, and that's the kind of honor that you should want. Not the honor of the world, but the honor that comes from God. You see, if you love him, you will be willing to do that. You will be willing to please him. I think if we were to summarize all of these things and try to give a principle that the Lord is putting out, it's the same thing I think we saw something of this morning. The Lord does not want to take second place to your worldly pleasure, to your fun. And when you stop and think about it, what is it that gets in the way of loving the Lord and doing what he wants you to do and moving in the direction that he wants you to move except your pleasures, your fun? These are the things that get in the way. Now, the question that Jesus is asking you this evening through this text is, are you willing to give up the pleasures of the world in order to find pleasure in him? Will you continue to seek for your pleasure in the things of the world, or will you find it in him and in the things of heaven? You see, if you can't find it in the things that are above, you're not going to be able to let go of this world. You're not going to be able to pay the price the Lord calls you to pay and yet, if you were to enter into heaven, you have to be willing to pay this price. You must pay it. The author to the Hebrews, when he was speaking to those who had uh, left their home and their people, basically talking about Abraham and Sarah and so forth, to seek the things above, says, says as much in this text in Hebrews 11, 15, and 16. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, for whom has the Lord prepared a city but for those who are willing to leave the country that they were born in and to seek after that heavenly city? You know, one of the biggest, largest reproaches against Israel was the fact that once God delivered them out of Egypt, 
that in their hearts they wanted to return to Egypt instead of to go to that land which God had prepared for them. And basically that becomes a picture to us of the world that the Lord may have, at least we think, delivered us out of the world and out of Egypt, but yet if we find in our hearts that we want to go back to the world, we want to go back to Egypt, then we really haven't been converted. We really don't have heaven in our hearts. We really do not desire the Lord. And this isn't to say that even true believers won't struggle with this. But realize the Lord has prepared a city for those who are willing to seek after it, to leave the world behind and to go after it, is that what you are willing to do? Now, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking uh, about the fact that um, when you're younger, you're, I think you're more vulnerable to the temptation to, uh, well, to go after the world and to seek after fun. It's one thing, but you don't really realize how short life is. And you think you've got all the time in the world, and you can kind of deal with those things later in life. But as you get older, you begin to realize that you're not going to be able to hold on to these things, that life isn't really that valuable. And actually, there's kind of a catch-22 there, because sometimes we begin to seek after the things of the Lord because we realize we can't hold on to the things of the world, and that's not really a good reason to seek those things. If I can't have this, if I have to give this up, I might as well get this, you know. I mean, again, God doesn't want second place. But we do have to admit that as you get older and you realize that, yeah, these things, I, I'm not going to be able to hold on to them for much longer, then it also helps you to see more clearly just how worthless these things really are. I mean, there is a reason why God gives the things of the world to the wicked people of the world rather than to his people. And it's because they're worthless. Remember the, uh, the psalmist, I think it was in Psalm 73, where he talked about his own life, how he was basically scraping for existence, it seems, in some ways. He, he didn't have what the wicked had, and they were so rich and healthy and you know, they had everything they needed. They weren't uh, struggling. There weren't any pains in their death. One of the things he talks about is the fact that their body was fat. They had plenty to eat and so forth. But he says, I've been sort of disciplined every day and stricken every morning and so forth. And life has been difficult for me. And as he thinks about his life versus their life and wondering why it is they have all these blessings and this prosperity while he seems to be struggling, he comes into the house of the Lord and then he realizes what their end is, that God puts them in slippery places and how they're cast down in a moment. And realize it's better to have the little the Lord gives than to be ensnared by the things of the world. It's better to have the Lord with a little than not to have the Lord with a lot. And again, it's God gives these things to the world and he gives them to the wicked because he knows they're, they're worthless. They have no value. I mean, what good is something that's only good for this life? It's not nearly as important or as valuable as those things that last forever. And those are the things that are above. Those are the things that our Lord is willing to give us. Now, Jesus says that in order to follow him, you must be willing to give up all your possessions. In your heart, you must give them all to the Lord. And basically, without reservation... John Gerstner used to say that if you have so much as a nickel that you claim to be yours, you're not a Christian. In other words, if there's something you're holding on to, I'll give you everything else, Lord, but not this nickel. Or I think it's usually more than that, of course. But if I'm not willing to give it all up to him, then whatever I think I've given to him, I've given to him for another reason, not because I love him. If it was, I would give him everything because that's really what he calls me to give him. Basically, it must be all or nothing. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was in the law, he replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll certainly keep this commandment because this is the greatest, this is the most important one of all. But in order to keep this commandment, everything else has to be a distant second. 
And you must be willing to give it all up if the Lord should call you to do that. In your heart, you realize it belongs to Him. Isn't that what the Bible says? It's just a stewardship that's entrusted to you. You don't really own these things. They're only entrusted to you for a, a small period of time in order to use these things to provide for your own needs, but also to glorify God. And the Lord wants you to use those things to honor Him. And one of the ways you do that is by realizing that it is a stewardship and that it really doesn't belong to you. And so you must love the Lord more than anything else. If you don't, you're not going to be able to pay the price. You're not going to be able to give up these other things that the Lord should call you to, and especially you're not going to be able to give up your sins and put on Christ. Now the second point, and more briefly, is, is this. How can you do this? How can you love the Lord strongly enough that you would be willing to set aside that which is most important to you in this world, your closest relations, the most coveted objects that you possess, your money, any fame you might have, any pleasure that you, that you might hold dear, even your dearest sins, especially when there's a part of you that still wants to hold on to those things. I mean, if there wasn't, there wouldn't be any struggle, right? There wouldn't be any question. Yeah, I'd get rid of those things and I'll embrace the Lord. Sad thing is we still have sin in our hearts, still flesh. So how can you love the Lord enough in order to let go of these things as the Lord calls you to? Well, essentially, you can only do it by walking on the same path that leads to a stronger faith, as we saw last time. And that is through the means of grace. When your faith is strong, there's two things that happen. You not only see the things which the Lord talks about in His Word to be real much more clearly. Those things are real, whether you see them or not. It's just that faith helps you to see them as being real. You not only see them, but you desire them more strongly because the faith that we're talking about here, that faith which saves, has a particular quality about it, something that comes with it, sort of a package deal. That faith works by love, Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 6. It comes with love. It produces love. It allows you to see something, but not just its reality. It also allows you to see its value. It allows you to see its beauty, its preciousness in the kind of light that makes it so precious that you're willing to give up everything. You see, if this faith did not produce that kind of desire in you, you never would have reached out and received the Lord Jesus Christ because faith works by love. Now what that means is that this love that you need to give up all these things and pursue the things of the Lord will be cultivated along with faith as you cultivate faith. They're both going to rise and fall together. And they're going to rise and fall according to how much the Spirit of God is at work in your soul. And as you know, that depends on two things. Your faithfulness in using the means of grace and your faithfulness in turning away from the things that give up all that you gain through the means of grace when you resist the Spirit of God, when you grieve and you quench the Spirit of God through your sins of disobedience. Another reason why you need to give up your sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, again, uh, the means of grace is just a, a summary phrase for prayer and reading the Word and worshiping the Lord and praising the Lord and, and um, hearing His Word preached and participating in the sacraments and participating in fellowship. When I say use the means of grace, you know, we might tend to just sort of dismiss it. Oh, yes, I know that, you know. But it's not enough to know it. You have to use the means. and You have to use them diligently. And I would say one of the most important, I mean, they're all important, but perhaps one of the most important is prayer. Giving yourself to seek the Lord, and of course, according to His Word, and not just alone, but with the people of God, but praying is so important. Of course, the others, as I've said, are also so important. Got to use them. As you use them, the Spirit will fill you. The Spirit will guide you. 
The Spirit will help you. He will lead you. He will do everything that you need Him to do in order to grow in grace. But again, as I've said, you not only need to do those things, but you need to avoid losing those benefits you gain by using the means through resisting the Spirit of God, quenching and grieving Him. So basically, <clears throat> we have here what we might call a virtuous circle and a vicious circle. And sadly, sometimes we're in the vicious circle, but we need to get into the virtuous circle. And basically, if it's this. If you were to find the strength you need, it's only going to come through love. You have to have the desire. Why is it that people give so much to particular goals in life, except that they want them for some reason? They've taken hold of their hearts, and they pursue it. That's the only reason why anyone has accomplished anything in this world. As Edwards reminds us, if you took away all affection from the world, it would slow down and come to a standstill because affection is what moves people to do the things that they do. Well, if you were to find the kind of love, the, the holy affection, religious affection, as Edwards would put it, that you need to put your sins to death, to give up the world, to live righteously, then you have to avoid sin, which grieves the spirit, and you must do what God commands. You must use those means, and when you do these things, avoiding sin and using the means, then obeying the Lord, of course, which is the same thing as avoiding sin, it will strengthen the work of God in your soul, and you'll be more easily able to turn into the right path. And as you do that, you'll grow stronger and stronger and stronger. It's a virtuous circle, you might say, that spirals upward as you continue in that path. But you need to realize that there's a vicious circle as well where you don't spend as much time in the means of grace and you don't obey the Lord as you should. You don't put your sins to death. You don't live to righteousness. And the more you go down that path, the more you quench and grieve the spirit and the weaker you'll be and the more difficult it becomes to do these things. That's a vicious circle that spirals downward. Now think about your life. And what is it that you actually do? You know, are you on the virtuous circle or are you in the vicious circle? Well, if your goal is really to reach heaven, then you will get into the virtuous circle and use the means of grace to gain the faith and the love that you need to put off your sins and to put on obedience. And you'll do it more and more, strengthening your faith and strengthening your love. And of course, when both of these are strong, your progress towards heaven is not only going to be more obvious to you, but it's going to be obvious to everyone else as well. Your assurance is going to be stronger, and your ability to give glory to God will be much stronger when you're willing to pay the price the Lord calls you to pay. But don't forget the vicious circle and don't forget this as well, that if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have to start here with faith in Him. If you haven't, if you haven't trusted the Lord, you really can't get into the virtuous circle. You will not be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You will not be able to give up the world. It's still going to have its hold on you. Um, you have to to trust in the Lord. You need the grace which God provides. Again, I mentioned before, you're only going to do what you want to do. And you're not going to be able really to trust the Lord Jesus and to embrace him in the way that you should unless you see him in the way that you should, unless you see him as something desirable. But in order for that to take place, the Lord has to give you his spirit. He has to open your eyes. And so you need to pray that the Lord would do that, that he would open your eyes to see his beauty and to see the desirability of the kingdom of heaven, that you might trust in the Lord, turn from your sins, and to begin walking with him in righteousness. So let's not forget what the bottom line was of, of this, this whole uh, sermon, which is basically this, that in order to put off your sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the terms that we've been looking at this evening, in order to give up the world and everything you possess, in order to gain the kingdom of heaven, you must, first of all, see that these things are true. And you must 
desire them. But you're only going to pursue them to the degree that you desire them. So in order to have a stronger love for the Lord and a stronger faith, you have to use the means of grace. It begins with a trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, but then it's a lifelong process of dying to self and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, of using the means that he has given you to that end and growing stronger and stronger in him so that you're willing to give more and more to him. If the kingdom of heaven is important enough to you, then you will be willing to pay that price. If it isn't, then you really need to pray that God would open your eyes to see its desirability so that you would be willing to pay this price. Well, may the Lord grant that each of us here this evening would be willing to do so. Let's bow in a moment of um, silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to... Um, to help us do that and to do to love him most of all.